everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles. The series of books and videos on American history is seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is in the life of Herbert Hoover, and the focus is the Depression Won't Relent. The year is 1930. It's kind of late in the year. The economy in the United States has been struggling for about a year. Unemployment ticking up around 10% now. And President Herbert Hoover trying to figure out what can he do, what to do to help the American people through this, this difficult time. Well, one of the things he did was he created the President's Emergency Committee on Employment. He put Arthur Woods in charge of this group that was modeled after some of his relief efforts from World War I, the CRB and the ARA, which was focused on centralized plans planning, decentralized execution, premise of voluntary cooperation being at the heart of this. It's not about government mandates. They established about 3,000 local chapters of this group across the country, principally to try to raise money and maybe accelerate projects, local projects, anything that they could figure out to put people back to work. Now, Hoover was accused by a bunch of folks during the Depression of kind of doing nothing. Well, in this area of public works, he certainly didn't do nothing. In fact, during the four years of the Hoover administration, they spent about $2.4 billion on these public works projects, you know, building roads and bridges and, and ports and things like that. That was more than the last 30 years combined in the United States with some really large projects. You've got the San Francisco Bay Bridge that went up during this period, the Mississippi River Bridge, and that mammoth new dam going underway on the Colorado River outside of Las Vegas also being spurred on at this, this period of public work spending. But Hoover had his principles about what to spend money on and what not to spend uh, money on. And he would still thinking about vetoing certain legislation that would be things that were beyond where his principles would take him. For example, building a dam like the one in uh, Nevada perfectly okay. It had long-term benefits, multiple states, needs large capital investment. Eventually it would pay it for itself and then some. That made sense. But the Muscle Shoals power plant on the Tennessee River in Alabama, they wanted to go a step too far for Hoover. Not just water, uh, water power and generation of electricity, but they wanted to get in the business of distributing power, actually sort of that next end uh, of the spectrum of electricity. And for Herbert Hoover, this was a mistake. I am firmly opposed to the government of which is in competition with our citizens. I hesitate to contemplate the future of our institutions, of our government, of our country, if the preoccupation of its officials is to be no longer the promotion of justice and equal opportunity, but is to be devoted to the barter in the markets. That is not liberalism, it is degeneration. This was a moral issue about American individualism that Hoover had written about a decade before, the concepts of federalism, the appropriate role of state and federal government, He's trying to hold on to those principles. But even for Hoover, those principles were not absolute. He said, if things got too bad, well, I am willing to pledge myself that if the time should ever come that the voluntary agencies of the country, together with the local and state governments, are unable to find resources with which to prevent hunger and suffering in my country, I will ask the aid of every resource of the federal government, because I would no more see starvation amongst our countrymen than would any senator or congressman. For Hoover, that point had not arrived yet. In fact, in early in 1931, Hoover really believed that the country has started to turn the corner. Then the bottom fell out. Economic disaster coming from Europe. Now, he had actually gotten a little bit of a warning about this. The U.S. ambassador to Germany, Frederick Sackett, had come to Washington to talk to the president. He basically said Germany and Austria are teetering on collapse. Neither was getting any relief from Britain or France about their large reparations payments that were due. Eventually, they were unable to make those payments. The largest bank in Austria collapsed. It sent ripple effects through this region. In fact, the German president, Paul von Hindenburg, was so uh, nervous about the economic affairs in his country, he wrote a personal letter to President Herbert Hoover. In the letter, von Hindenburg said, in order to maintain its course in the confidence in the world and its capacity, Germany has urgent need of relief. You, Mr. President, as the representative of the great American people, are in a position to take the steps which, by an immediate change in the situation threatening Germany and the rest of the world, could be brought about. The question was, what could Herbert Hoover do in this circumstance? He did realize that the American public 
actually had a lot of exposure to Germany. American lenders had about $10 billion of exposure. So if Germany uh, economic, economy collapsed, it was certainly going to be that much worse for the United States. But again, what could he do? One of the pushes of really over the last 10 years was for the United States to forgive the war debts for Britain and France. Now, this had been controversial in the United States. People mostly did not want to forgive those debts. The debt had to be paid. They were open to renegotiating, but not forgiveness. Now here again in 19 31, people were thinking, well, if the U.S. would just forgive those debts, then maybe Britain and France will relax a little bit in terms of the reparations payments from Germany and Austria, and things would get better all the way around. Well, Hoover wasn't about to go that far, but he was ready to take a bold move. After thinking about this for a while, talking to lots of people, congressmen, foreign leaders, and things like that, he decided on a moratorium. He was going to recommend a one-year secession of payments, intergovernmental payments, whether it was debts, payments, or reparations payments. He worked again with congressmen all behind the scenes. He worked with 15 different foreign governments to try to get them on board. All were in favor except France. They were the reluctant ones. They still didn't really seem to want to help Germany out at all. Plus, their economy was actually probably the healthiest in Europe at the time. Eventually, France came on board, and in June of 1931, Hoover announced to the world this one-year moratorium. Now, a lot of folks breathed a sigh of relief. This was going to be great news. But for Hoover, he didn't get all that much personal credit in the United States because he did all of his work behind the scenes. Many of these battles had to be fought in silence, Hoover later said, without the cheers of the limelight or the encouragement of public support, because the very disclosure of the forces opposed to us would have undermined the courage of the weak and induced panic in the timid, which would have destroyed the very basis of success. So even when Hoover seemed to be doing something right, this one-year moratorium, it turned out to be kind of a political failure because he continued to be accused of doing nothing. What did he say? Well, hideous misrepresentation and unjustified complaint had to be accepted in silence. And the part of the problem was not only was this politically not all that advantageous for Hoover, like he might have hoped, it also didn't work that much economically because Britain was next to fall. Brit the British economy had been sort of the bedrock of the world economy for, for generations, but Britain did go off the gold standard during World War I. They came back on it, been on it for about six years now. But with all this chaos going on in Europe, there was kind of a run on gold in the, on, on the British banks, and it became pretty clear that the Brits were also not going to be able to make payments in gold when some of their debt payments were due in September 1931. Sure enough, they couldn't. They went off the gold standard and almost immediately 40 other nations followed. Not the United States, but 40 other nations. It's sending sort of economic chaos now on the currency markets across the world. And this did affect the United States because now there's a run on gold in the United States. And bankers and people in the U.S. saw all this happening. And sure enough, they did panic. They started hoarding their own money. Banks not making loans. All of a sudden, unemployment is sticking upward and upward, about 15 percent now. The stock market came below 100 for the first time in 1924. For Herbert Hoover, this was just one crisis after another. The office in such times as these make its incumbent a repairman behind a dike, he later said. No sooner is one league plugged up than it is necessary to dash over and stop another that is broken out. There is no end to it. Early in 1931, Hoover thought the country was on the road to recovery. Now, clearly a whole new ball game. And what was he going to do? Well, he decided to engage the U.S. bankers and talk to them directly. And he had an idea in order to be able to get some more confidence in the American people, more loans being made, and more money being spent. His job in his mind was to facilitate a change, again, not mandate, but to leverage the private sector in a, in a fund, a $500 million fund that would be put forward by the large banks in order to help the small banks remain solvent. That would give depositors confidence, and again, they would stop hoarding and they would start spending money in the marketplace. He invited 50 financial leaders to come to Washington for a conference. But again, trying to avoid panic, they didn't hold the meeting at the White House. They went to the Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon's large home, and they all came to an agreement. They would establish the National Credit Association, the NCA. This would be that $500 million fund announced. It was a bold move, some positive press, at least a little bit for Hoover. But the problem was it didn't really work. Even this fund, for some reason, again, privately run, was skittish about making loans even to these small banks. So a little, only a little bit of that $500 million seed money was actually being spent. So 
Hoover said, look, this isn't working. We're going to go to a plan B. And this time, the government was going to be more involved. A new pool of funds, $500 million authorized by legislation by Congress, would come forward for this pretty much same purpose, making loans to the smaller banks. This fund had the authority to borrow up to $1.5 billion more, again, trying to get that credit uh, flowing again. This was a big philosophical leap for President Herbert Hoover. He said for the first time in history, the federal government must intervene directly to support private business. They called it the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the RFC. And Hoover told him, so a couple of things that would sort of make him feel better. Number one, this was still loans being made, not handouts, and that was important to Hoover. Also, he thought, look, it's an emergency. This is going to be temporary. The RFC will be around for a couple of years, and then it'll be gone. Of course, the RFC was around for 20 years, but Hoover didn't know that at the time. Hoover helped get some other legislation passed, working with Congress to establish home loan discount banks, make specific loans to help people, people stay in their homes and on their farms. They also passed the Glass-Steagall Act, which gave the federal government through the Federal Reserve the authority to issue paper currency that was backed by U.S. securities, trying to relieve some of that demand on U.S. gold. One of the more controversial moves that Hoover now put into place was he believed it was necessary for the United States to have a balanced budget to show economic stability. Now, they were running in 1931 about a $462 million deficit. That was projected to grow to $2 billion in 1932, in part because of all these new public works projects that were being approved. But Hoover started to become fixated on a balanced budget. At a time when revenues were down, what else did he, could he do? Cut spending? and raise taxes. Now, economists would probably disagree, many of them, with this kind of a strategy of the fact that you're going to raise taxes and cut spending at a time of economic depression. But Hoover was really fixated on this notion of coming up with, with a balanced budget as, as being absolutely critical. The country understands that an unbalanced budget means the loss of confidence of our own, of the government, and that the consequences are national demoralization and the loss of 10 times as many jobs as would be created by this program even if it could be physically put into action. Now, many of his opponents thought this was heartless. What, you're going to take more money out of people's pockets by raising taxes? Charlie Mickelson and the Democrats were hammering Hoover about the Hoover Depression, the Hoovervilles that were, uh, the poor people were now living in. He actually was doing a lot in the eyes of the people who worked for him. In fact, Ted Joslin, his press secretary, called Hoover the workingest man I have ever known. He barely slept. He worked nonstop. But again, mostly was behind the scenes. The country was struggling. He was getting very little credit. And he's at odds with the Democrats in Congress because they wanted to spend. This is coming up on 1932, an election year. The Speaker of the House, John Garner, he's pushing big spending programs to try to get people back to work. Unemployment in 1932 is now topping 20%. People are looking for something from their government. And uh, Garner thought this would be a way to get credit for it. It would help in the election and put people back to work. Well, Hoover was again against this. He thought that this was a bloated package, $2.3 billion of works projects coming from Garner. Most of it he thought was waste. According to Hoover, this is not unemployment relief. It is the most gigantic pork barrel ever proposed to the American Congress. It is an unexampled raid on the public treasury. He vetoed that measure. He wanted to get to a balanced budget, not just spend willy-nilly on stuff that frankly wasn't going to matter and make much of an impact anyway. He decided he was so worried about this that he went to Congress himself. The only time Herbert Hoover as president went to the well of either the House or Senate to make a speech was May 31st, 1932. He went to the Senate urging them to pass his economic uh, model. In your hands at this moment is the answer to the question whether democracy has the capacity to act speedily enough to save itself an emergency. The nation urgently needs unity Hoover told the United States Senate. Well, this was an election year. The conventions, Republican and Democrat, less than a month away when he gave this speech, he was resolved to solve this problem before the recess. Can he get the votes? Well, he did get a tax increase, about $1.3 billion. It was progressive, but it hit people at the top and bottom of the, of the economic scale. 
in terms of spending relief, he wanted $750 million in cuts. He got $150 million. It was certainly not going to balance the budget, but he eventually signed these bills because he thought it was least heading in the right direction. At this point, Congress was heading out of town. People were gathering for those Republican and Democratic conventions. Time to figure out who was going to lead the country going forward. But that is the story for another day. That is Herbert Hoover, and the Depression won't relent from the life of Herbert Hoover. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.